Aye, we're going to look at some key aspects of the broad philosophical movement we now call postmodernism. After the peaceful collapse of the Soviet Union, Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no alternative. Fukuyama suggested it was the end of history because historic events like wars and revolutions would not happen again now that Western liberalism had won. All that was left was for more and more countries to join the liberal project and just tweak the political system here and there. This period is often viewed as the peak of postmodernism. The term postmodernism was popularized some decades earlier by a leotard who portrayed it as a current in modern cultural thought, chiefly characterized by the belief that there are no grand narratives. For example, when people in medieval Europe had a swollen foot or a neighbor they suspected of flirting with their husband, they could fall back on the grand narratives of Christianity. They could go to the church for advice and the church would have answers. Leotard coined the term postmodern to refer to an era in which there would never again be unified narratives which could explain the different things that matter to us in our lives, or which groups of people could unite behind to define themselves and their progress. Even hard sciences like physics seem to be offering a range of competing narratives about the fundamental structure of the universe. This challenged the clockwork universe view of Newton and the Enlightenment. If there are no grand narratives, then the way that teachers, governments and scientists get people to agree on what is true is a matter of power and discipline. We all have the will to gain power over others and to keep others from exercising their power over us. So we create categories like progress and crime and institutions like schools and prisons and labs to sustain our current power structures. Foucault suggested the we should find the centers of power, the king, and challenge them. According to Baudrillard, with the loss of grand narratives, we have lost the ability to gain knowledge of who we and others are. All that is left to us is to signal who we are through the things we buy. We can choose trainers or breakfast cereal or a political party that create an identity for us um, to perform. While modernism could broadly be characterized as revealing underlying structures in apparent reality, whether through Marxism, psychoanalysis, linguistics, or the projects of people like Vladimir Propp, who uh, suggested key similarities in the world's fairy tales, postmodernist thought is characterized by undermining such structures suggesting in some ways that it's appearance all the way down. According to Bruno Latour, we have never been modern because modernization is a construct like everything else. Latour argues that King Tutankhamun could not have had arthritis because arthritis had not been created until many years after his death. According to Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, Everything that existed or could exist in our world is an assembly of interweaving mechanisms. A tree is a machine collecting sunlight and expelling oxygen, and a war is another machine involving bombs and newspapers and exploding limbs. For Latour and Deleuze, humans are just more parts of these ultimately meaningless systems. But isn't our world full of structures like fast food places and marriages? Deleuze and Guattari acknowledge this, but suggest that these representations of the world are temporary and incomplete. They are all undergoing a process of deterritorialization, through which the differences that define them dissipate, much like the smoke and smell from a lit match dissipates in a the room. They connect this effect with the second law of thermodynamics. Fast food places are already having cashiers replaced by self-service checkouts and extra tables are being removed because Uber deliveries have reduced the need for them. In Papua New Guinea, where wedding guests would bring specially chosen gifts to display they are a big man in a ritual dating back centuries, some are now setting up 
a contactless debit card machine at the entrance. The ritual is being deterritorialized until there is little difference between it and buying a Big Mac. Deleuze and Guattari, of course, stress that the main engine behind this deterritorialization is capitalism. Far-right philosopher Nick Lands follows them in suggesting capitalism is in fact an unstoppable artificial intelligence. Land looks forward to the day that capitalism will seep into every crevice of our existence and deterritorialize democracy and humanity itself, letting intelligence exit the constraints of human culture to form superior unities. Within the postmodern society, objects can become so detached from their original meaning and history that we forget it altogether. For example, few of us would think of an actual mouse when we see Mickey Mouse ears. Baudrillard calls the Mickey Mouse ears a simulacrum of the real mouse. Las Vegas is one of the most postmodern places on earth because it's so full of simulacra. It is an imaginary museum of dead things, to quote Jameson. You see the Eiffel Tower next to a Sphinx, next to a giant Coke can. We would not ask the architect if she has Egyptian ancestry or what the flashing blue eyes represent. We accept that it is there because it is, because it's fun and exciting and works at getting us to go in and spend money. This is why Leotard argues grand narratives like Marxism will never work. We don't want things that are better or truer because we are satisfied with a simulacra. Most people know how sausages are made, but we want the sausage meat anyway. No matter how bad our lives might be, capitalism has provided us with enough things to satisfy our desires. In fact, most of us are likely to fight for these simple pleasures than fight for a revolution after which we might not be able to finish watching our favorite TV series. Many people have been attracted to postmodernism because it speaks to their lived experience, for example, living as a gay person or a black person in a cruel and controlling society that manipulates them at every level. The problem, as Spivak has argued, is that in handing down their critique, authors like Foucault have contributed to the sense of entrapment and alienation rather than offering any ways to fight it. Though Baudrillard's critique of consumerism echoes criticism of capitalism made by Catholic theologians back in the Enlightenment, something about his account still strongly resonates with us today. Baudrillard seems to capture our experiences in modern life, especially in the age of the internet. He seems to anticipate a sort of impasse or blockage in our experience of culture. Mark Fisher called this cultural style capitalist realism. You can read his description of capitalist realism in the experience of Kurt Cobain and grunge music. But what if this cycle of temporary pleasure and frustration or as Fisher calls it, depressive hedonia, is itself a product of capitalism. What if Baudrillard's story about our society sounds so appealing because we have ourselves internalized the capitalist ideology which produced it? Fisher highlights what Marx was already warning us about, the ways in which capitalism leads to stereotypes and how we act and think. Fisher highlights the ways in which capitalism limits our imagination of possible alternatives, by severing us from others and from basic concepts like public space. We are instead handed down the fake freedom of the Uber driver, being given apparent personal choice while really being forced to internalize the regimes of control and accountability that a worker would get from a boss or foreman a century ago. In our own time, Adam Curtis can have his documentaries about the ravages of capitalism aired on BBC because the only antagonists in the story are us and our consumerism. As Fisher puts it, citing Slavoj Žižek, it is almost like being critical of capitalism 
at this symbolic level is what's necessary to keep allowing yourself to perpetuate it. Postmodernism can also be seen in American analytic philosophy. Richard Rorty, following a tradition that includes uh, John Dewey and Nelson Goodman, argues that epistemology is unnecessary because there is no such thing as truth. There is only agreement, which can always be renegotiated. Rorty argues that since truth is relative and contingent, we should take an attitude of ironic detachment towards life. We should not commit to any belief too strongly and should treat others' claims to knowledge with doubt. Philosophy, for Rorty, is no different from everyday chat. Rorty's philosophy is explicitly motivated by his commitment to bourgeois liberalism, by detaching ourselves from ideologies or foundational vocabularies, as he calls them. We can free ourselves for self-creation. Irony without ideology is the style most easily associated with postmodern art and culture. Mark Fisher argues that this cynical denial of ideology is itself the dominant ideology of our time. But again, this is not a tragic conclusion. Realising that this is itself an ideology means realising that it's possible to overcome it, to imagine an alternative.